Um, I'm also thanking you to uh, yourself and Nikita and Nicole for the invitation to share this work. It, it, you might regard it as a little bit dated, but it's still relevant. Um, it occupied a large part of my time once I moved into a teaching focused role. Um, and uh, enjoyed it immensely and uh, got to meet wonderful people who were mentors to me in the chemistry education community and you'll see lots of familiar names come up as I talk about the journey and I'm going to present this as a, a sort of a journey in, in our efforts around undergraduate research in courses. Um, and so uh, I, I called it finding a cure because I think it, the search for a um, laboratory learning um, activities as such um, really is, is quite hard sometimes and it does depend on the learning outcomes that we hope students will have. So, oh, now this is not going to let me move it sideways. There we go. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the country that I'm standing on here in Brisbane and the custodianships of the lands in which we meet and they're the Yagara people. And I'd like to pay our respects to the ancestors and descendants who continue the cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize the valuable contributions to Australia and global society in particular in the around the, the University of Queensland where I work in terms of the guardians of knowledge. And it's important that we just spend that moment to recognize those contributions. I'm also going to put my acknowledgements up front because um, I always end up running out of time, but I just wanted to kind of give the sense that what I'm doing here is not presenting individual work, but actually work that's, that's part of the efforts of many different people combined in different teams. And I think as teachers, uh, we don't do things as individual endeavors. It's for, we're usually fortunate to be able to work with people who are invested in the same outcomes for our students. And I'd particularly like to call out um, Sandra Larson, who's guided us since we started this work in 2008. She's been a critical friend, but also a formal evaluator of a lot of our projects. And so um, just putting that up front to hopefully, as we go through, you'll spot some of these names coming up and how they were involved. So why did we need a cure? This all started back in 2008. And um, really, when I first came into um, a more edu education focused role from a research only focused role, um, and I was I, I actually many people may not know that I have a qualification in high school teaching as well. And so uh, I had spent some time working with high schools as well and looking at student learning and the laboratory learning. And we had the symptoms in our large general chemistry classes that many people have. There was um, this turning around of students through lots and lots of sessions. They come in, they go out, these tight time frames. Students are generally disengaged. Many of them don't want to be there. They can't see the connections to their particular programs. We serviced up to 47 different programs at that time. We had course sizes of between 1,200 and 1,500 students. And our own chemistry majors were really a little bit Bit hidden amongst those cohorts uh, they didn't stand out so everybody was getting the same experience and the students perceived the learning to be very much the verification of the lecture content now this is at a time um, when there was quite really important work being done by many people that you'll be familiar with in terms of um, looking at changing the way that we delivered laboratory learning and so we, we went we we're trying to go away from the traditional uh, verification labs uh, through introducing inquiry, so different levels of inquiry and the work of Marcy Towns and Stacey Larry Bretz, of course, in characterizing the level of inquiry was important at that time, but also the work of Gabriella Weaver at Purdue and Don, who's here, was also involved in that work and, and, and and many other folk around the US were starting to look into these ideas of course-based undergraduate research experience. And so we were fortunate at that point, and it's always sometimes a critical trigger that, that helps you to have um, Gabriella visit us. And we started to think about this idea, well, where, how can we give students um, that maybe are going to be chemistry majors or uh, big chemistry majors, that different experience in first year that, that kind of engages them a little bit more, gives more value, but also uh, the other students maybe 
think about why they're doing the lab that they're doing. So we introduced a little bit more inquiry in the traditional labs, but we, we offered what we called an undergraduate research experience. And just so that you know the, um, our definition of the difference uh, between what's called a cure and a year, or the year is often called an apprenticeship undergraduate research experience. Um, and many universities offer those. And that's where the student will go and have an internship as such in a research lab. So they're being mentored by the, um, uh, the research group leader directly, they're possibly um, a postdoc and postgrads, and it's actually sometimes the students are being completely mentored by the postgrads, but we won't talk oh. about the various situations you get there. Now in a teaching lab or a cure, um, course-based undergraduate research oh, experience, we have um, the different um, sort of structure because the research group lead is very important, but they sometimes are peripheral to the student's experience. The course coordinators driving the course, the tutors are acting in that role of, of mentors um, to the students more. But we also have the lab staff as stakeholders and their investment and all those people come together to kind of give this um, scaled up version of a research group internship, but in a classroom or a teaching lab as opposed to being in the researcher's own lab. And so it's quite different, but it has the potential to give the same um, similar learning outcomes. So as I said, Gabriella came to visit us for a sabbatical in 2008, and we worked with her to um, embed the CASPI um, experience in the first year course in second semester. Now CASPI is the Centre for Authentic Science Practice in Education and it was based in Purdue and involved a group of collaborators at other universities such as Don and Pratiba, um, uh, not, sorry, and Marcy and um, Pratiba Varma Nelson worked on the peer um, assisted study sessions that supported students through this. And so they'd done a lot of work and they had uh, great modules and exemplars that we could pick up and actually just translate into our courses and we we um, used their resources and we linked to their researchers and that was something that uh, was very important at that time sort of giving us the students that authentic research experience and um, so our students were invited to opt in so they are asked to express interests um, and we didn't cap because we never got a, a rush. There was always a certain group of students, but it wasn't just high achieving students um, that came to do this particular research experience. And it ran from 2008 through to 2013 in that, um, that sort of format. And then it tra transformed into something else at our institution. The main form of assessment was a lab notebook. And then we coupled that with other forms of communication of the research outcomes. So the important elements of the CASPI um, URE uh, cure was that the students got to plan their experiments they went through a skill building phase with the instrumentation that they needed to use and the methods uh, they could choose what they worked on there was no right answer they're generating new data that was relevant to a researcher uh, they were supported outside the lab by peer interactions and past leaders and they had access to more advanced instruments than we would normally give first year students so our students at that time linked to uh, the real researchers, as I said, at Purdue, and we had the um, phytochemical antioxidants module, um, Jay Burgess, and we had the solar cells energy conversion module um, from Kyung Shin Choi. Uh, it, Jay uh, in, even created a video for our, dedicated for our students and um, so, sort of we, the interactions, tried to get them stronger. Um, we also uh, tried to get our students in Brisbane to talk to Don Wink's students in Chicago about the solar cells modules. And so we were trying to make this connection by, with these real researchers and other students involved in these modules. Um, and and th th that was harder to do though. They, they, the researcher seemed a little bit daunting, especially when they were in the US for our students. We adapted CASPI into um, our own versions of it as such with our own researchers in second year. So there was a curriculum progression. So Joanne Blanchfield was involved in, with biomarkers and herbal me medicines in second year chemistry. And Susan Rowland um, offered a, in a large biochemistry course in second year um, a, a based on her research and, and the collaborators research uh, 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 an experience around um, expression in cells. And so, um, as I said at the bottom there, the students were uh, 
extremely invested. They showed great engagement and ownerships of the projects, but they were just a little reluctant to actually share the outcomes because the CASPI model um, sort of hoped that the data the students were collecting were fed back to the actual researchers. So there was a way um, of sharing that back, but our students in, in Australia didn't um, really readily uh, submit their data, which was, um, it was curious to us at the time. So we saw learning outcomes that we observed at the time where we saw increased engagement and the photos you're seeing are actually CASPI students and we have their consent to share these photos. Um, there was enhanced awareness of the scientific process and the purpose of the experiment. Um, we saw gains in their skills in data processing and manipulative skills. And we saw that um, they had a deeper understanding of the nature of science. And that was a large part through the past sessions and their con conversations with each other, the exchanges they were having, uh, planning the experiments, the iteration, and um, increasing their uh, language um, around the whole experimental process. And we used a lot of different um, quantitative scales uh, that came, uh, there was the CASPI instruments, but we also used something with the scale, which was called URSA. And I actually meant to look up to see if URSA is still being used. Uh, that came out of Sandra Larson's work, which was the undergraduate research. Uh, oh, I can't even remember what it stands for, but it's U-R-S-S-A. -S -S and so, and we saw in all of these different scales, I've just picked one out and I haven't even labeled it properly, but we saw again, the CASPI students generally had um, higher sort of uh, feed, uh, feedback, self-perception data than uh, the um, traditional non-CASPI students in most of the items, they were pre-post scales. So this started a, 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 a long process and you can see on here that um, it, if I go through from 2008 to today, we actually ended up um, expanding um, uh, the way that we worked with others um, through the whole sort of experience uh, to, to be um, through a national project and through working with uh, US co uh, collaborators in CureNet, um, this became really a big, I mean, sometimes I say bigger than 10 bears, <laughs> because um, we were part of a community and I want to reinforce that idea of this shared understanding about um, course-based undergraduate research experience that has evolved over this time frame. And if you look to the literature, if you search, there is a large number of articles around cures and what the assessment of them. So evaluation of the actual instructional implementation, but also of student learning outcomes outcomes. And it's not just in chemistry, it extends into biology, um, and maths and statistics and lots of other STEM subjects. So it's a really well, now a well recognized um, laboratory option for students that is beyond um, that is a transition into the research um, experience of a, a, an apprenticeship style um, uh, uh, experience. Uh, so we, as you can see there, the bits I've talked about, we had Gabriella come and we had translated and adapted the initiative. And then uh, Susan Rowland and I got an institutional grant um, to translate this in, um, whole initiative and evaluate it more deeply in the large biochemistry course. And through this, we actually attracted more adopters at UQ. And then through the um, Australian Office for Learning and Teaching, um, leadership grant, we actually expanded outside UQ into other institutions and we brought in more UQ adopters as well. And just around at that time of that grant, um, we were invited by Sandra Larson to attend a working party meeting um, in Chicago at the, at the airport, everybody flew in um, and where we discussed because everybody was struggling with this idea of how do we know students are actually learning from cures? We can do the self, um, self report data. We can look at shifts pre post in effective scales or thinking or identity um, as scientists or as researchers. But what about other aspects of the learning outcomes? And so this whole working party was about establishing um, a, a framework or advice for others to, to consider in looking at um, assessing student learning outcomes. So um, the, the other pieces that come off it are all around dissemination, but a question around sustainability is always interesting. Is this, are still things, are things still running today? And I'll come back to that. So uh, we went from local mentoring to a national initiative with mentoring. And that, as I said, took up a large part of our time for a few years. Now, as I mentioned, one of these um, 
iterations or projects that came through this whole process was our work with the um, second year biochemistry course and uh, when we first started doing that, um, we were looking at the comparison students could opt either into the um, undergraduate research stream or they could go into the um, traditional stream, which had been um, boofed up a little bit with inquiry. And then so with Susan, we, we um, looked at the types of things that we were hoping that students would gain from these experience and then assess them against uh, self-report data about their confidence in the different skills. And you can see it's a little bit hard because these are really quite complicated and a lot of things assessed. But if you, if you look to the right, you can see the technical skills involve the LTs, the DTs and the PTs. Um, so it's the first three uh, groups in the table here. So these are things that we might consider that should be common to both um, groups such as weighing, reading scales and thermometers and indeed you can see with the LT indicators here that the, the, if we look at the, um, the uh, um, the different groups, the yellow and the red, uh, the pre post um, indicators uh, for the, uh, uh, the cure students and the green one and the blue are for the traditional stream. So you can see the basic skills are pretty much equivalent. There wasn't there was no significant differences there. But what we're seeing in terms of the other aspects, um, so the, the looking at uh, creating and preparing and the importance of the different um, assays they were using, we saw gains in the students that had more exposure and iteration around those compared to standard experiments. And if we look at the last um, two areas, uh, we again, then we see that the um, LAs, which are the deciding if one approach is better or another in planning my experiments, there was not much significant difference, but the um, CURE students uh, had more confidence in most of the other skills that they were um, gaining through the experience. So this is all about that idea of, okay, well, the students are feeling more confident, the, um, they've opted into, they've chosen to, to do a, a CURE, um, and so we're seeing some learning gains from that whole process. So the outcome of the meeting in Chicago, and I've put uh, the names of the people that were involved, and you can see that um, I met, met several members of our chemistry community were there. There were also biologists and biochemists um, represented. Uh, was that we, we decided, well, what are the design features of a cure that are important to have? And so it had to have scientific practices that were relevant to the discipline. There needed to be collaboration between the students. There needed to be opportunity to iterate. So to do an experiment and then redo it, changing variables or redo it if it didn't work. There had to be an element of discovery that the, the data that was being produced was new um, and that it was relevant to something somewhere. So whether it was a research or um, it was to do with um, some sort of uh a larger thing, um, for example, in biology, the, there's some consortia that look at data collation that, that kind of the, the data might relate to. But the really the, the major thing that came out of this work was the um, focus on the learning outcomes. And so what you can see is that um, through this discussion, we decided, well, actually, the more participation you have in the cures, um, the greater possibility of learning gains being um, aggregated and becoming deeper level um, in that understanding and science. So they get to the point of self uh, science expertise, self authorship, and science enculturation. So we're going from short term outcomes, um, which are often what we assessed. Um, we, many people, when they introduce cures, would look at the um, students' performance in the course overall and whether the cure had impacted um, in comparing two groups. Um, the skills like we did, we, we focused on the technical skills and the analytical skills. Um, we're looking at things like project ownership and how students collaborate with each other and with, with the faculty. But really we want to start to get to um, some of this the higher level learning outcomes um, and through uh, those perhaps embedding in, in the curriculum and, and linking or building on the learning outcomes that are, that we um, measure so. So the um, 
just examples of, of some of the projects that came out of our national um, initiative, we kind of categorized them in what happened weekly, um, what the and techniques and skills are, what the assessment were, was, and you can just a snapshot of a few of them here. Uh, if you look at the assessment box at the bottom, you, you can see that um, they often they were just really the scientific um, journal or article style report or scientific reports, and that really has a, that that format of assessment is very similar to a traditional lab so if you're splitting your students in two and you want to make sure there's equivalence in the assessment that's a good option but really was it addressing some of the um, learning outcomes we'd hoped for in this previous slide and uh, was there more imaginative ways um, in implementing cures that we could actually measure those learning gains. And so you could see um, that the STARS team on the right introduced things such as an e-portfolio and a lab notebook um, into those assessments that they were doing. So one of the outcomes of the national project was we put together something called a herds a guide and that's part of um, a series of publications from the higher education research and development society of australasia and it came from a collation of the evaluation across multiple projects and so what we proposed was actually well, if you're designing a cure and you want to look at the assessment you've got to, um, two sort of domains where you might be looking one is the um, the discipline domain specific laboratory knowledge and skill you, you saw earlier that in the uh, leaps and the laws example they were mainly biochemistry techniques that were there of course in chemistry we had a different set of um, skills and techniques that we would focus on and then there's the other skills that we see coming out of these cures um, which are becoming more important particularly for employability in terms of critical thinking and problem solving and creativity uh, interdisciplinary thinking when looking at the relevance of the data and the findings and into other areas uh, there were some interesting ones that we uh, we had there as well such as patience and resilience or persistence in failure um, because a lot of our evaluation showed that students in the cures actually um, were able to pick themselves up when something didn't work and have another go and actually were, were not sort of kind of the confidence um, was higher so that they they were that a bit more positive about that whole process and if you can think about your students in a traditional laboratory when it doesn't work they blame the lab manual or the or the reagents and so that idea of those have been extra skills that are important out of cures is something that we valued So since 2014, when the working group got together and published that um, paper around the assessment of cures, um, there's been an enormous amount of research. And I've just snapshotted um, four titles here from that and looking at how students are learning from cures. And so backwards design is really important. So one of the things that I'm kind of like my messaging from this presentation is that the learning outcomes that you want to focus on should drive the assessment, of course, Course. so learning outcomes then the assessment then that links back to what the students do in the cure and so there's, there's nice work around that and I'll show you some examples of that too of course being the editor of SERP um, I can't not put some of our own article examples up there there's some, been some really nice work done by jo Joseph Harsh and uh, that was back in 2016 but there's also a paper published in uh, this year about measuring um, integrated understanding of um, chemistry research experiences through oral and written research artifacts. So there's a lot of ideas out there for the different types of assessments that you could put onto the cures to, to align with the authenticity, but also um, measure students learning um, in tangible ways. Oops, what's happened there? Let me, oh, go back. Um, and so one of those papers that I had before, the impact um, uh, broadly relevant discoveries on student project ownership, I think that ownership is something that we've found over the many studies that we've done, that students' investment in the cure comes from their sense that they have the control over the experiments, the iteration, the data, but there's a value to it as well. And, and this paper here done by um, Sarah Brownell's, Brownell's group, um, showed that they did some nice work in looking at, um, again, self-report data, uh, but students um, 
so they explored the five elements that we proposed um, in the 2014 paper and then looked at uh, whether there was a difference between cures and traditional groups of students. And you can see there's not a lot of difference when you're considering things like collaboration and iteration. So, uh, but the, it starts to come into the dimensions of the discovery, discovery and relevance. And they, they did some linear regression and found um, relationships between and differences between cognitive ownership and emotional ownership um, in terms of what sort of the, 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 um, the, the, the the drivers for the students um, learning here. So uh, they found that cure students reported higher cognitive and emotional ownership over their projects um, compared to the traditional students. And that makes sense because um, the traditional students are generally following the, the more guided or recipe based um, activities and that students perceptions of collaboration and making broadly relevant novel discoveries were uh, significantly and positively related to their cognitive and emotional ownership. So we still keep getting that messaging that the students choose to do the cures um, because they want to have that um, ownership and uh, work on something that's novel or discovery based. And uh, th so the, this is something that they're actually gaining from this experience. They're looking for it and they're gaining from it. So one of our own studies, um, we looked it into this idea of authenticity and we uh, did lots of interviews of the students, whether they were in the traditional, uh, actually it was our honours students, um, Susan's honours students and the project officers that did a lot of the interviewing and analysis here over a few years. Um, but what we found that is that the traditional students and the um, sorry, the LEAPs, which are the traditional students, and the Allure, which are the CURE students, uh, we, we asked them about um, what uh, the, their definition of, of what authenticity is or what you know experience of what scientists do and how science is done and the relevance and ownership these are all themes that came out uh, out of literature first through a literature review but then we saw that the students only really raised those first two themes the most and so they are identifying that with being a scientist um, through what they're doing and we, we're seeing that the um, personal relevance is important too. So going back to that idea of the assessment learning of learning um, and the perception going beyond perception data, so a lot of evaluation of the effectiveness of cures is the pre post um, effective scales or the identity scales or the, um, the elements of the cure and how they're working for students. But if we're looking actually at um, other forms of assessment. As I pointed out before, the lab report or scientific article, the journal article tends to be the most uh, widely adopted, but there are other options. So lab notebooks, of course, in science practice are central to chemistry. And so we focused on um, developing um, assessment and rubrics around using lab notebooks, including um, online versions of that in wikis, uh, oral presentations, so giving talks, Posters is another of our favorite avenues, getting students to communicate um, individually the outcomes of the group project and also uh, student discourse or um, the, the way they collaborate or their argumentation around the science that they're doing uh, uh, is important in terms of the assessment. Of course, there's many other things and the CASPI modules gave us lots of great examples of different assessment forms that we could choose if we wanted to when we first set out with this. So I just want to finish up by giving some examples of, um, let's see, oops. I don't know why it's doing that shadow thing there, um, of, of the things that students generated. And of course, student generated work is the best way to find out the way that they're thinking. And so here are some of the CASPI posters when, from the antioxidant module. And we found that students um, uh, did a great job generally in first year. Often they're not asked to do um, poster activities until higher levels. And they communicated and we had a, um, we would run um, either virtual conferences or we'd print and display the posters um, in a central area in our building. So the students could see how the other students are both within their groups had communicated the same work and then also between groups. And the antioxidant module was fabulous uh, because they could choose anything to basically food wise to explore the uh, antioxidant activity of. And we got all sorts of stuff in the lab. And sometimes it smelled like MasterChef walking into our first year laboratory 
with what they were doing. They were, you know, pressure cooking strawberries, and we had some people um, electrocuting mung beans, and um, there was sometimes a little bit left of field thinking, but on the whole, they they actually came through with uh, good approaches and through iteration decide, discovered that the, the, they had to um, apply the methods um, to fairly truly to be able to get data that was useful to interpret. And so that, that it was an enjoyable experience for everyone, for us to see this, these products as they finished. Um, the other thing that we did was the, um, the lab notebooks which were wikis and uh, this is work that came out of the um just i'm going to call it more discovery than undergraduate research experience and i'll explain why in a second but we have third year nanoscience students and we got them to use a wiki to work together to collaborate and develop shared understanding of their data and communicate and report it um, and we looked at the way that they interacted with the each other with the instructor or the um the tutors in the lab and how the tutors could um, go into the wikis and give that guidance as well. And now I'm going to say why I don't consider this a true cure and, and I can be I'm very happy to be debated on this. Um, the elements of the cure are here. However, what we don't have is a real researcher or that um, so the relevance of the data to an audience beyond the course. And I think taking that away removes an element of the authenticity. We haven't actually measured that, but we could perceived it as we were working and we've, we've iterated this many times, um, but didn't actually do that evaluation. So, um, the idea then is who's the audience well this whole project who's the researcher who's the audience the, the, in this uh, group work um, the students chose um, a paper that's been published in um, making a nanoscience material there was all sorts of things from particles to films um, and they used that as their start point and then they changed variables or explored different um, materials in the process so it is still a discovery research process it has several of the elements of the cure um, and the wiki gave them the ability to collaborate and share the understanding of what they were doing and the tutors still serve that role. So that pseudo research group structure that we were, we look for in a cure is there in the sense of the different um, stakeholders um, in uh, terms of the classroom based undergraduate research activity. So what did we do? We focused on the wiki in supporting a lab notebook. So the students made their record, they took all the records there. Um, they formulated their hypothesis. They applied their um, data processing skills. They displayed their data and they presented an argument or a discussion around the data that they had. And so the focus of the lab notebook as being useful for an avenue for, as a, for assessment for the cures um, worked out really quite well. And so uh, the the activity of uh, we would hope for, for students in that in terms of collaboration planning data collection and appraisal and a consensus discussion um, was still afforded in the wiki environment and so we evaluated what students did uh, through consenting groups all the work that i've spoken about has been under ethics um, and so I'm sharing the, uh, apart from the posters, and I've blocked out the names, but all the students consented for us to share this particular screenshots here. So what we saw was all the elements of a traditional lab notebook appeared in the digital lab notebook. And there was actually more affordance in the sense that some students, as you can see from group D, um, it made a more uh, integrated uh, communication of the work in a lab notebook. And of course, now that many researchers groups are actually going into e-lab notebooks um, and so students embedded images to and uh, they would work together to, to communicate the outcomes and the process and to do those iterative experiments and so over several weeks so I think we're just about at time there. So um, I think from what, what I hope to have given here that is the idea that cures um, are not just upper level course experiences. They can fit across an entire curriculum and they can um, fit across different curricula. And I actually, I think Katie and, and Joy, who are speaking later on, um, I think you've published around building across a curriculum with different um, subdisciplines of chemistry um, so, and linking the cures together. Um, 
um, the assessment should align with the intended learning outcomes. So we've adapted that we wanted the assessment to focus on a lab notebook uh, to capture the collaborative nature of the interactions between students in the last example. Um, I think I, I, I can only say that implementing a cure needs an invested community of people. You need your lab staff to be on board. Um, you need the tutors to be invested in. The first time we ran the CASPI, the tutors weren't convinced it was going to work. And we actually had some disruption from one tutor, which was unfortunate. So I think there needs to be everybody starting on the process of implementing a cure need to be on the same page. Um, and so I've said it's really tailored to context. So horses for courses is what we discovered when we were working with lots of different people in different institutions and in very many different ways of approaching it and uh, as I say backwards design is ideal think about the intended learning outcomes first so with that note thank you I did my acknowledgements at the start so